Welcome to another episode of the Tom Shimmer Podcast. Happy Monday, everyone, and happy March 1st. <laughs> what? March 1st already? Unbelievable. You know, it's hard not to reflect on the fact that we are coming up on a year of COVID in terms of quarantine and shutdowns and physical distancing and all that we've had to endure. I know many of you have been reflecting on that as well. And I know we had cases prior to March of 2020, but mid-March of last year was when it all kind of came to a screeching halt. On March 1st of last year, I was in San Francisco with my colleagues Mandy Stolitz and Garnet Hillman, and we were debuting our two-day training for our book, Standards-Based Learning in Action. And we were there when that cruise ship was held out of port with reports of so many COVID cases on board. And we obviously knew that COVID was a thing and very serious, uh, but we had no inkling at that point how the world was literally going to shut down just two weeks later. It's hard to believe that was a year ago. It in some ways feels like a lot longer. And I know we still have a ways to go, yet uh, I am feeling optimistic on the whole right now, so I hope you are too. Thanks for listening in again this week, and as always, a big welcome to new listeners joining in for the first time. Uh, all of your listening and subscribing to the podcast means a lot, and I really do appreciate it. And if you like what you hear and feel up to spreading the word on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or wherever, I would appreciate that too. Uh, today, I'm excited to have Natalie Conway joining me for the interview. Natalie is an online educator, so we explore that and some of the differences between a remote learning model and online learning. In Assessment Corner this week, I'm going to focus on report cards and one of the very important aspects of redesigning report cards that is oft overlooked when it comes to creating a more accurate and transparent way of reporting. So that's today's plan. Let's get to it. My conversation with Natalie Conway about online learning is coming up in a few moments, but first, don't at me. But I want to open this week by, unfortunately, letting you know that you are biased. And so am I. Years ago, probably at least 30 years ago, I heard Stephen Covey say, we judge ourselves by our intentions and others by their actions. And that has always stuck with me. And I think I've mentioned this a few times on previous episodes. Now, when I heard that statement, I knew it to be true because I had seen it unfold so many times in my own life as well as the world around me. One of the ways this assertion is most easily spotted is when someone begins a sentence with the words, I was just. As in a child or a teenager saying, I was just trying to take the garbage out and you got all annoyed with me. Or a teacher saying, I was just trying to ask a question during the staff meeting and it seemed the principal got all offended. Or when you're driving, you might think to yourself, I was just trying to merge and this jerk cut me off. I could see this playing out all around me, and I wasn't immune to it either. You know, I, I knew it was true, but it didn't stop me. We're not always the most accurate and objective at perceiving ourselves or even making sense of the environment or the circumstances around us. I knew that, but I never really understood why. Okay, now a slight tangent here, but I promise you we're coming back to the larger point. Among many of the frivolous things that COVID has interrupted in my life is my podcast game. Now, I've been on the podcast train since about 2009, and a few years after that, when I started traveling a lot with my consulting work, podcasts became my go-to source for news, sports, current events, interesting topics, and so on. Pre-COVID, I had somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 to 17 podcasts in my rotation, which sounds like a lot, but they weren't daily podcasts. And with my schedule, I could really get through them quite quickly. There'd, you know, there'd be one podcast on the drive to the airport, one, maybe two on the plane traveling, one on the drive to the hotel, one in the hotel, you know, sports on TV, sound off, listening to a podcast. Uh, there'd be one the next morning driving to the venue, future flights that week, and so on, right? So there was a lot of chances for me to get through a lot of those podcasts. But with COVID, they're piling up on my phone, which I know is somewhat ironic because you're listening to my podcast now and Maybe you're listening to it in May. Who knows? <laughs> we don't know. Anyway, one of the interesting podcasts I've recently tapped into is called Hidden Brain, and it's hosted by Shankar Vedantam. 
And it's been out since 2015, so I'm definitely late to the game, but it's a really interesting podcast. And it's essentially a podcast about human behavior and life's unseen patterns. Anyway, episodes have been piling up on my phone, so the other night I decided to reach back to an episode from January 4th of this year, and the guest was psychologist Emily Pronin, and she was discussing something called a double standard that she felt exists in psychology, and it's the double standard that Covey had asserted 30 years ago. It's the double standard between how we see ourselves and how we see others. She calls this double standard an introspection illusion. So finally, I said to myself, there's a label for what I've always known to be true. Now, essentially, all of us have a blind spot. And while research shows that we are fairly deft at recognizing the existence of bias and its impact on human judgment in others, we tend not to see it in ourselves. Pronin asserts that research shows our blind spots come from a number of different sources. First, there is self-enhancement bias, which is probably the most well-known. We just see ourselves in the most positive light, even if evidence suggests otherwise. There's self-interest bias. This is where we make judgments that serve our own best interest. And Pronin uses the example that uh, physicians tend to recognize that other physicians may be susceptible to the effects of gifts from pharmaceutical companies, uh, but they themselves claim to be immune uh, from those same uh, influences. Three, there's prejudice and group-based biases. That's where we tend to just outright reject any racial bias or gender bias we might have. Uh, We believe we're completely immune to that. Number four is a bias that we might have in prediction, assessment, and estimation. So, for example, we tend to under-predict how long most tasks will take us. And then, of course, the fifth one is direct demonstrations of bias, which is just people tend to report directly being less susceptible than others uh, to each of the aforementioned uh, influences. So where does this come from? Why does this happen? Well, the tendency for people to overvalue their own introspection is what Pronin calls the introspection illusion. It's our tendency as human beings to give a heavy amount of weight to our own introspection, even though so many of our actions are the result of our unconscious mind. When asked why they made a decision, the vast majority of people will cite their own reflection, the balancing of information, and most of all, their intentions. What we tend to downplay is other information, specifically like our actual behavior. And here's the rub. We tend to heavily consider our own internal information as being much more significant, but we rarely afford others, or even consider that others, may have done the same level of reflection that we did, right? We judge ourselves by our intent and others by their actions. So this happens, Pronin says, because we suffer from what is known as naive realism, because we're even more likely to assert bias on behalf of others when others don't see things the way we do. We are, she says, naive realists because we generally assume that we see the world as it is in an objective way. We see the objective reality. You think about what is exactly wrong with politics today, or maybe what's wrong with politics ever, is that when people don't see things the way we see them, we just assert that they're biased and that they have some sort of uh, skewed view of the world. As soon as someone asserts a position not aligned with our thinking, again, we assume they haven't thought it through or they don't have all the information, or must have been susceptible to one of those sources because they're obviously biased, right? Politically, the left accuses the right of being biased, and the right accuses the left of the same. It's, it's basically a vicious circle. Now, maybe, maybe it's heightened now because of the, I don't know, collective sense of entitlement or collective self-indulgence, but uh, I'll save that exploration for another podcast. From a political sense, Pronit submits that new evidence in the research is showing that when people perceive others as biased, they actually respond with more competitive and more conflictual action. If that doesn't explain today's political climate, I don't know what does. You think about the different perspectives on COVID right now as well, where everyone is claiming to have the facts. Well, they can't all be facts. Okay, so let's, let's bring this back to education, and here's why this really caught my attention. Going forward, try to recognize that your own introspection illusions and naive realism 
can be at play when it comes to the consideration of new ideas or new systems or new practices or processes in your schools. Force yourself to afford others the same benefit of the doubt that you afford yourself rather than resorting to the whole, well, if they had thought things through the way I have thought things through, they would clearly have made a different decision or come to a different conclusion. An over-reliance on our own introspection, our intent, at the expense of other information, our behavior, is where this illusion emerges. Watch for it during your next meeting or next discussion. Not, I want to emphasize this, not to call people out or embarrass them, but to find out whether or not this introspection illusion has infiltrated the interactions you're having with your colleagues. Purposefully ask people to articulate the full depth and breadth of their thinking so their thought processes aren't hidden. Help them make it obvious that they too have thought things through. These biases can be problematic and really can't account for so much of the disconnect and conflict that can emerge through differing opinions of the best way forward. Now, as for students, you'll recall last week, I talked about the four directions and two dimensions of student self-reflection. And as much as I am an advocate for student centricity, you know, I'm a huge advocate for self-assessment and the self-regulation of learning and inquiry-driven learning and personalized learning. We, as teachers, as educators, have to remain involved actively involved, if for no other reason than to make sure that introspection illusions are not prominent in the minds of immature learners. Now, don't get me wrong. We, we have so many mature learners in the sense that they are mature for their ages, but they're not mature in the grand scheme as far as their physiological development. Introspection illusion alone is why we can't just turn it over to the students and back away when it comes to self-reflection and self-assessment. It's not a zero-sum game. They may have blind spots when it comes to their own learning. Blind spots when it comes to honestly recognizing the degree to which they've met the learning goals. Now, engaging students in the metacognitive exercise of trying to view themselves more objectively, I know that's not easy, but it might make the student-centered experiences more meaningful since unaccounted for inaccurate self-assessment is counterproductive. Your confirmation of student assertions about their own learning is exactly how students are going to learn to trust themselves and trust their reflections. Your expertise matters. As their reflections become aligned with yours, they can know that their view of their learning and their view of themselves as learners is more objectively correct. No one is immune to this. No one. You might think you are. You're not. And neither are your students. However, I do think we can reduce the impact of introspection illusions through awareness and actively being open to where we might be wrong in our default assumptions about how right we always are. Joining me today for the interview is Natalie Conway. Uh, Natalie is an online special educator and a mentor teacher for Frontier Charter Academy. That is a public statewide charter school in the state of Oregon. Uh, she is also an instructional coach for SYS Education. Uh, she's been teaching for 17 years and has worked both in traditional brick and mortar schools in Massachusetts and Oregon, as well as online schools, of course, in the state of Oregon. She's a workshop facilitator. She is also a mentor to individual teachers, and she uses an instructional coaching model to do so to mentor those individual teachers. And Natalie is also a podcast host. Uh, she hosts the SYS Presents Adventures in Online Education, where she interviews leaders in the world of online education. And that is actually where I found Natalie. Uh, well, I, I found Natalie on Twitter and then discovered her podcast. And uh, after the episode on assessment, I thought to myself, you know, I should really try to have Natalie on the podcast to really dig into this online learning, remote learning, uh, things we can learn about all of that entire world. So Natalie, I want to welcome you to the Tom Shimmer podcast. Thanks, Tom. I am really excited to be here and really appreciative of the opportunity to talk with you today. Yeah, it's great, great to have you here. And and certainly as I've, you know, we talked a little bit before we started the interview, we, we talked about just how you know, so many of the uh, disruptive moments for people over the last year has forced them to consider online options. And I think yeah. both acutely, we're talking about how do I pivot to remote learning, 
But we're also talking about districts maybe looking down the road to say, you know, we need to be ready for this in a, in a more uh, viable way. So I want to start with this question. What's, what does the Venn diagram between online learning and remote learning look like? So obviously COVID, as I said, forced the majority of teachers to at least acutely uh, pivot to a remote learning model. So where is the contrast and where is the overlap between online learning and remote learning? Yeah, that's a, a great question because they really are not the same. And even to sort of zoom out a, a step further from that, sure. brick and mortar teaching is not the same as remote or online teaching. They, in my mind, are two totally different jobs. Mm -hmm. And I hope that we come to a point in public education where we're teaching, we're treating them as two different jobs. But to your question, remote versus online, I think of the difference as remote being a temporary solution and a, and a temporary existence and online learning being more permanent. So if you think of like UDL or ADA compliance for a, a sort of physical manifestation of this, remote learning is like the plywood put together ramp that you see on the side of the building that was put okay. on after the cement stairs and <laughs> online learning is the the cement ramp that's right there that leads you up to the front entrance and was always meant to be there. So I really think, you know, that's kind of the main difference where they're the same is that they both can harness awesome technology and tools right now mm -hmm. to provide equitable education for a whole bunch of kids across your district or across your state. And as long as teachers are supported, so having the training they need and having access to the tools they need, and as long as students and families are supported, they both can be really successful. Can we go back to your stepping back and saying the difference between brick and mortar and remote learning, never mind online learning? I mean, there's obviously the the the, the obvious differences are, you know, one is remote, one is face to face. Right. But what are some of the when you say the differences in treating them differently? What are some of the nuanced differences that you see between, you know, the idea of of being in a face to face brick and mortar school versus a remote learning situation? Well, there is just that whole idea of a child sitting at a computer, right? Mm -hmm. If they're an online student, then that's where they're getting their instruction is on a digital device of some kind. And we cannot ask them to sit at that screen for hours on end a day. You know, we ask students in a brick and mortar school to sit or be in their physical classrooms from eight to three or whatever it might be. And you can't do that with a computer. And so they really are two different kinds of education and not that one is better than the other. They are simply different and they mm -hmm. offer different benefits and drawbacks. And so when you're moving to remote or to an online setting for education, you need to just consider that and keep in mind what your goal is and what you're going to be using your time for, because mm -hmm. it completely changes how you're going to approach curriculum, how you're going to approach live class time. And we just, I really, I feel like it's just something that's so drastically different that we need to, to treat it as such and just acknowledge that and be okay with it. And that's, I think a hard part it's, we value seat time a lot and, um, we need to start thinking about more what students are doing and, and why they're doing it and does how long it takes them to do that really matter. Maybe, right. maybe not. Is that something that you noticed um, last spring? So obviously as an online educator, as you, as you watched the education world pivot uh, to remote learning acutely, or you know, some schools are still remote right now, as you watch that almost as yeah. a third party, because you, were, you are already working online, yeah. is that something that you noticed? And, and, and if so, what else did you notice about some of the things that schools did that maybe in retrospect, we should have rethought that the idea, for example, of a student being on zoom for six hours in a day, trying to replicate that class schedule. Is that, is that expectation something that you noticed that you kind of cringed at and thought, Oh no, that's not really. And if, and if so, what else did you notice about how the models unfolded last spring and into this school year? Yeah. I mean, first off, I just want to say, I give all the school districts a ton of credit because oh, yeah. It was just who expected it, right? And who mm. was prepared? And how do you pull this all together on a public school budget when the year is practically over? 
insanity. Right. So I mm-hmm. give everyone oh, yeah. Yeah. a ton of credit for yeah. whatever they did and however they tried to do it. Um, mm-hmm. The thing I noticed um, was the seat time first. And it's because I have friends who are in brick and mortar schools and, and teaching and who pivoted to remote learning and they were just super stressed out and didn't know what to do and were had these expectations that, you know, they were basically going to take their brick and mortar schedule and replicate it online. And I was like, oh, that's, that's not how you do it though. Mm -hmm. Um, That's not going to work. And, um, you know, and it was hard because no one knew the the laws, the rules are just different and it wasn't clear. So that was one of the first things I noticed. And it was through conversations with my, honestly, just my friends who were experiencing it. And um, the other part is just expectations for behavior and how kids will be online, how they'll exist online, even something like Zoom, you know, oh, well, the kid never has his camera on. And now I don't know if he's there. It's like, Mm -hmm okay, well, what else are you doing to, to make sure he's engaged or she's there and with you? Um, a lot of things came up for me, I guess, just around equity and creativity for how we are working with, with students and with families, Mm -hmm. because the expectations just, like I said, they have to be different because now you're in their homes and Mm -hmm. that's a privilege and not something that we, we get when we're a brick and mortar teacher. And so taking that into consideration and kids were in teachers' homes too. Right, and so right. <laughs> we knew it was a little bit of, of madness. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So teachers uh, or students, I should say, uh, seeing behind the curtain, wow, you have a home. You know how students act when they see you at the yeah. grocery store or they see in those situations. And Natalie, your point is so well taken. Really? Um, you know, what happened last spring was an impossible situation for schools. And you have to just give it up to teachers and school districts that tried to, um, you know, make sure kids had access to technology, that they had bandwidth, that they had yeah. the ability to engage in the learning. I think so many school districts went way above and beyond. Well, it's not above and beyond. They did what was necessary to make mm-hmm. sure that this, this kids were engaged. So, uh, you know, I, it wasn't my intention to imply that, that you know, we oh, cringe yeah. at what they did, but, but it's important to just, as, a, as an observer, I'm just interested in your perspective. Now, you know, yeah. uh, so many uh, people, when they think about online education, uh, and maybe even students, you know, or, or uh, I should say teachers, inside the education system, maybe those outside the education system, when they think about online or remote learning, um, they think about, you know, packets, they think about facts, they think about recall, they think about just sort of churning through material to, to get credit for completing their packet of information. But you say that online education allows for teachers to move curriculum beyond the right, wrong answers and to require students to think critically and to work more at the top of the taxonomy at learning. So, how, how does that happen? Yeah. And how do we convince the masses that online instruction is not less than you would receive in a brick and mortar school? Yeah, I get that kind of a lot, actually. Mm-hmm. Once you people do. realize your schedule is different, you know, yeah, I am not teaching Monday through Friday, six hours a day. Right. <laughs> like, Wait, what are you doing then? <laughs> um, uh, and, you know, my kids aren't sitting at the computer that amount of time. Um, once you get past that, it's like, great, right, well, then what what exactly is happening? And so when you move to online education, you can't have your answers be Google-able anymore. If if kids are Googling your answers, your questions and finding answers, then you're asking the the wrong question, right? There's something deeper that you can do there. And I think that's the, the huge opportunity of online education is that we assume that you know, a kid who's old enough to to know how to Google an answer will do so. And then what will they do with what they find? that's the next step and that's where we're engaging and that's where we're moving to. So there definitely are schools out there, um, online schools out there that are kind of packet factories and kids do just check the box and move on to the next thing. And that's the least of what online education can be. And, you know, that's part of the reason I have my podcast. That's part of the reason I work for SYS is because we have this vision. I have this vision of what online school can look like for students and it's project-based learning. It's using the flipped class model. It's using Mm -hmm. at the very least projects and getting past rote memorization or just accessing these basic skills. You know, I'm a, I'm a special education teacher and sometimes we as special ed teachers get stuck in that bottom part of blooms. Like we need to teach kids X, Y, and Z, and, and then we'll get to the other stuff. And it's like, well, flip that on its head. What if we start with the other stuff? 
mm-hmm. and we scaffold and we, we give kids those, those other skills they need for sure. But we, we engage more with the, the analyzing, the synthesizing, the right. coming up with opinions and ideas. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've really enjoyed that with online education because there is just so much available online and you know, all your kids have a computer and they have access to the internet. And so you're really going, you're going beyond in a lot of ways. And it's, it's easy to do. And it's kind of freeing for the students once they realize like, can I, can I just look that up? You say, yeah, of course you can. That's what adults do. That's what we do in the real world. That's what I want you to do. I'm not going to pretend like you're not going to have a calculator in your back pocket for the rest of your life because you will. So go ahead <laughs> and use that. But yeah, yeah, I think that's part of it. Like we're just acknowledging um, the future a bit. Like we're acknowledging that th- these technologies exist and kids can use text to speech and they can use speech to text and they can use calculators and they can look up what used to be an Encyclopedia Britannica or, right, you know, that right, set right. of encyclopedias in the library that we're not opening anymore because we don't need to, right. we don't need to do that, move them, move them to the next thing. And it's going to just be way more engaging and mm-hmm. way more of a learning opportunity. For sure. Now, when we think about um, online learning, one of the sort of pushbacks that I hear, and I, I don't necessarily hold this position, but I'm interested in your uh, take on you know, people talk about, okay, online learning is, okay, I can get my head around that. But they might say, Natalie, what about socialization? What about this social mm-hmm. context within which, you know, schools also provide that kind of socialization and the building of mm-hmm. social skills and all of that? How do you respond to people who push back and say, well, you know, face-to-face online might be okay to a point, but there's that social component of schools that we might have to consider. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think COVID has taught us that we're all really social beings, no matter how introverted we might feel we are on that scale. Like you still need people and we are social creatures and there is absolutely opportunity for, for socialization online. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, you and I met through Twitter, that's an online social platform, right? So there's that kids have the opportunity, the platforms on most comfortable and, and knowledgeable about our Zoom and Canvas. And they both allow kids to communicate with one another. You, know, mm-hmm. you can share videos in the discussion. You can use breakout rooms and get kids to be talking to one another, collaborating on a Google Doc, those sorts of things. So there are opportunities for students, and there should be opportunities for students to talk to one another, to engage with one another and discuss mm-hmm. in terms of you know, that more free form socialization, like what would happen in a lunchroom or out at recess. Yeah, that's, that's sort of more up to the individual child and their families. Right. And a lot of the reason that kids who choose online school, um, not, not all of them for sure, but a portion of students choose online school because of the negative social right. interactions they've had in a brick and mortar setting. So mm-hmm. for some, it's actually a safe haven from bullying or from sort of negative interactions in a brick and mortar. So I think at the end of the day, you know, if we look back as adults on what we did in school and how much socialization genuinely took place there, like really what happened was when I was playing softball or when I was playing ultimate Frisbee or when I was at (laughs) dance class or when I was in band, like that's when I was socializing. That's when I was talking with friends. And so online doesn't take that away from yeah. kids, there's still those opportunities and they're important. Yeah, they are important. And I think your point is well taken that um, socialization doesn't just occur at school. And and again, the, the context of socialization now, um, given the fact that the world is is in, in, in some ways virtually closer together and yeah. that we have connections with, like you, like you said, you and I met on Twitter, we have connections, you know, I know people around the world that I would never be able to talk to if it wasn't for technology. And, and we are very social in that sense. So I think it's yeah. sometimes just comes from a place where it's not what I was used to when I was younger, you know, for, for parents and adults, it's like, this is different than what I experienced. And, and that's probably where a lot of that pushback comes from. Is that what you see? Is that kind of like, this isn't what I was used to? Yeah, I think yeah. that's a lot of online education period. It's just, it's different and it's not what we're used to. Yeah, right. it's like, oh, kids don't need to sit at the at school for six hours a day. Right. Oh right. yeah, you know, socialization actually will happen still in their neighborhood or in whatever they do for right. extracurriculars. And exactly. so, yeah, I think that's that's just a lot of it is accepting that 
you know, our, our culture has changed so rapidly in such a short amount of time and it's going to continue to. And so we just need to get comfortable with being uncomfortable and, (laughs) and knowing that 10 years from now is not going to like, I, my daughter's four years old. I have no clue, you know, when she's 21, what will the world look like? I can't even imagine. It's going to be awesome, but I can't even imagine. I think this past year has taught us all to be comfortable with discomfort. That's that's for sure. Uh, so you're you're of course a special educator. Uh, educator. So I want mm-hmm. I want to try to see if you could walk us through, um, you know, co-teaching the inclusion model in an online environment. Uh, can it still occur, and uh, and and can it be effective for students, um, you know, who are in need of special services? Uh, how does that? Walk us through that model and and maybe give us some insight as to how special services might be delivered in an online learning environment. Yeah, absolutely. It's first off, it's different for every school. Um, You know, a charter school versus a a straight up public school, they're going to offer different things or a small school versus a larger school. They're going to be able to offer different programs and and supports. Um, Online school can be really effective and be a, a really good thing for some kids with special needs. It is not for everyone. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I have been co-teaching since I started my career. I've only ever co-taught. So it's what I know. It's what I love. And I'm a huge advocate for inclusion and co-teaching in brick and mortar and online settings. I think it's really effective. Um, Co-teaching really allows us to be better teachers because we're working with another teacher and we're honing our own craft in that way. And then we're making sure we're meeting the needs of all students. So it takes away that element of the kid with an IEP needing to have another class, needing to just have more going on in their schedule because more isn't necessarily better. So sure, there are kids who are going to need some extra one-on-one or small group instruction, or maybe they're working so below grade level that they still need some pullout. But for the most part, there is a vast majority of students on IEPs who could benefit and thrive in an inclusive setting. And so being able to co-teach, being able to have two teachers in Zoom running a lesson or um, parallel teaching, alternate teaching, whatever the method is you might choose for that, it's super effective. And it allows you to, to touch all the kids who need that help or need that specific instruction that week. And that's where uh, I'm also a big proponent of flip class model. So, you know, flipping your class and getting some data at the the start of the week can help you figure out those groupings further down the line. But a lot of special services can be provided online. And kind of what I talked to a little bit before, you know, things like speech to text or text to speech, super easy right? online where you might have to have a kid in brick and mortar with a physical scribe, someone writing for him or her, or, um, you know, you need to get all these audio books or that kind of thing. It's just so easy right. online to provide those accommodations to kids who need them. And, you know, the, the harder thing to provide online obviously would be like occupational or physical therapies and that right. kind of thing. So those, those are different online for sure. And certain right. schools treat them, treat them differently and, and can provide different things. For the most part, it's, it's a really big opportunity. And there's a lot of potential, I think, for schools to service kids with special needs Mm -hmm. in in their online setting, in the inclusive model. Yeah. Uh, What about English language learners? Do do you find Mm -hmm. uh, many uh, choose the online environment? And if so, what does support for ELs look like? Um, I mean, obviously, they're not a monolith. You've got to tailor uh, for you know, their background in school, they may just not speak the language, but be very right. proficient and competent, or they may have gaps in their schooling or et cetera, and so on. So without, you know, at the risk of treating them of ELs as a monolith, um, what, what does that look like in the online uh, environment? Really similar to what it looks like in brick and mortar. Honestly, okay. you're going to yeah. shelter your instruction and you're going to scaffold and you're going to provide visuals and you're going to do the same kinds of things that you know, we've been doing in brick and mortar, you can do online and and digitally um, Mm -hmm. really well and somewhat even more and more easily. Even something like closed captioned, you know, is coming in or live closed captioning, like Zoom has just added that as a feature. And so being able to have language be incorporated throughout the curriculum and be more tangible for students, Mm -hmm. all of that is just the same best practices or sound practices that you would use in a brick and mortar for teaching that those pedagogy kind of things apply online as well. 
Yeah. One last question about sort of the, the model. Do you, yeah. from your perspective, and I think, you know, we can always, it's always in the implementation, it's always in the execution, it can go either way, but what role, small, medium, or large, do you think um, online learning might play in terms of equity, in terms of inclusion, mm -hmm. um, and, and both from the perspective of racial equity, but also in the perspective of maybe socioeconomic equity, um, how, equity in general, what, what role do you see going forward that online education could play um, in, in bringing that more to fruition? Absolutely. I think there is a really awesome potential there. Okay. I think there really is. If we can continue to let go of what used to be and what how we think it needs to be mm -hmm. um, in terms of education. So, you know, if kids can come to my Zoom class with their cameras off, because I don't need to see their house. Um, if they can come to class with cameras off and be engaged, and I can know that they're engaged in other ways than actually seeing their face, right. that's going to be a really good thing for me and for them. Um, if I can be creating curriculum that is tailored to their needs and tailored to them as individuals and get to know them as individuals, awesome. Then I'm, I'm working for equity right then and there. Sometimes if you think of the drawback of the physical space, you know, like let's, let's go back to middle school or junior high, or everyone's psyched to, to go back to those memories, right? <laughs> like that, that was hard. It was hard to be you as a preteen or an adolescent, right. And be really just vulnerable and, um, and get to know a teacher. That's really challenging. Whereas online, um, we can give our kids snippets of ourselves to kind of hold on to and relate to. And then they can give that to us as well. And there's so many students who have gotten to know through digital means. And mm -hmm. it's different for sure. It's totally different. I'm not observing them at recess and, you know, checking out what they're up to in the cafeteria, but I'm getting to know my students because of the kinds of activities I'm engaging them with. And they're able to connect with me one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. way more readily than they could have in a brick and mortar. And I really think the root of equity and all of that is, is knowing our kids. So just knowing who they are, where they're coming from, what it is they, they like, or they need understanding their culture and, and what they're bringing to the table, their background. You can really do that online, assuming you don't have, you know, a caseload of a hundred kids or something, you can really start to get to know your students. And then um, if they stay with your school, you can, you can hold on to that information and share it with the next teacher. And that can become a, a portfolio of who the student is and, right. and what they need. So I think there's a lot there that gives us a way to reach kids. If we can get, you know, we call it one-to-one, -one, like every student has a device and every student has internet right. access. If you can get that first step to happen, then the rest of it can really fall into place with some, with some conscious work on the part of the teacher. Yeah. It, it just strikes me that the online learning environment is so conducive to, you know, when I think about assessment, which of course is, is most of what, what my think work about? entails, <laughs> I think about such a, you know, the opportunity to expand. And I've had this conversation with many guests on the podcast about how to expand our definition of what is quality evidence. What, what does that look mm -hmm. like and how we can provide students with different opportunities to show their learning, their deeper learning in ways that don't necessarily fit with our traditional view of assessment, but allow us to expand that view, which includes the opportunity to be culturally responsive with our assessment practices as well. So yeah, I think Absolutely. there's a, I think, I think I would agree with you in the sense, well, I should say, I think, I know I agree with you, but I think there's a lot there uh, for us to take advantage of for sure. Okay. So yeah. if a school wanted to add um, online learning to their offerings, uh, what should they do? I'm sort of picturing, you know, the rural school that may not have the student population to offer, uh, you know, one section of everything. So there's opportunities mm -hmm. to take courses, right? And so it's also possible that schools with large populations just don't have enough students interested in a particular topic. So let's, for example, say I live in Nebraska. I want to take a marine biology course. No one else in Nebraska wants to take marine biology. <laughs> uh, not enough students to offer the course. Plus, we don't have the expertise in the school to even offer that course. Could schools begin adding courses like that? Uh, and are they doing that already? And, and if so, what's the best way to go about that? How, how have you seen, if you have seen that, what, what's the best way for schools to go about adding those offerings when in the past we may not have been able to? 
Yeah. I'm just starting to see that now. Um, I'm originally from the Boston area and moving out here to Oregon became familiar with the idea of an educational service district. And mm -hmm. so some people might be familiar with that and some people might not, but that's where you kind of pull your resources. So we have, I'm in central Oregon and we have an ESD, an educational service district, which maybe would have um, say speech pathologists and occupational therapists, that kind of thing. And they would service a whole group of districts and the mm -hmm. same kind of thing can happen online. So if you're statewide and you have access to other online courses, you can pull into those. So I know Idaho has or has started something along those lines where mm -hmm. public schools in Idaho can tap into this statewide set of courses and instructors. And I think that's a really great way to go about it because when you're online, your reach is no longer physically constrained. You right. can you can go beyond your district. And I think that's really helpful popping into a community college, finding out if they have any offerings that maybe you could be offering to your high school, that kind of right. thing. Um, SYS can help with that in, in some aspects. And so that's really powerful, just coordinating with the resources that are available in your local area or in your statewide area, and then how to, how to build those or how to find them um, open ed resources, that kind of thing. So there are right. definitely possibilities for that. I, th I think that's really one of the cool things about online ed and the future of online ed is that mm -hmm. you could be that kid in Nebraska who wants to study marine biology and right. now that can happen. Right. And these, and mm -hmm. these would be like, when you talk about the Idaho model, uh, again, I, I don't know how familiar you are with it, but these would, these would not be modules. These are, you sign up, there's a teacher and I'm actually right. interacting with a teacher. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. yeah. An actual course, an actual course moderated by a teacher. And mm -hmm. I don't know exactly how they work, um, well, the ins sure. and outs, but yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's not just some canned one-off thing that you're getting, <laughs> but it's, yeah, it's something, <laughs> some <meaningful>. avatar, <laughs> right? Exactly. You're not talking to one of the robots, right? Yeah, that would be it. There, there is such an opportunity for, um, you know, you see, um, you know, so many schools are starting academies, they're starting, you know, sort of areas mm -hmm. of specialization. And yet, yeah. if you're a student who is somewhere else in the country, and you're and you're wondering, you know, how could I I have such a passion for that? There's such a potential there for online learning to to really allow me to follow that passion, which again, is is part of being learner responsive, you know, student centered yes. in, in our work, for sure. Uh, so for those who are uh, in remote learning right now, um, and le so let's pivot back to remote learning. You are, of course, an online learning expert, but let's talk about those who are used to being face-to-face, -face, but they are, they are in the midst of either remote learning right now, or, or they may even have to prepare to pivot to remote learning later this year, because we don't again. know what, uh, yes. again. So what advice do you have for, um, you know, for teachers who, and this kind of goes back to what we talked about earlier, uh, what advice do you have for teachers who haven't planned to be an online teaching? They, they're they trying to plan for remote learning. Um, and you've probably received some questions from folks over the, over the months about, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm and I'm being forced to move to remote learning, or I, I may have to do it again. What's some of the advice you give to teachers on how to be best prepared for that kind of pivot? Yeah. Well, first, I give them a big virtual hug. <laughs> Tell them yes. to do the same. Absolutely. <laughs> They're going to be okay and let them know it's going to be okay. I think my best advice I can give is to find the essence, find the essence of what you're doing and why you're doing it and start to value the complexity of whatever that is. Mm -hmm. So take your standards. And if you're an English teacher or math teacher, or a third grade teacher, whatever, take a look at your standards, either what you have left to cover for the year, or if you're planning out the whole year, just figure out the, the anchor standards, the, the big ones that, you know, all right, this is what I have to do in third grade. Cause they're not going to see it again, or they need this for fourth grade, or, you know, mm -hmm. here's algebra one. This is what I have to hit. Find the essence of whatever it is you need to accomplish with those students and backward design it. Mm -hmm. So think of your final product or a final question you could ask them that would show what they have learned for that standard or that set of standards and just backward design and fill it in from there. And keep in mind that less is more. So kind of getting rid of that, filling the time 
mindset or I have to do X number of activities a day. Just Mm -hmm. leave that to the side and just consider what is your goal? What is it that I need them to learn? Okay. What is the most efficient and effective way for me to get there? And start with that as your plan, start with the end in mind, work backwards, and then be open to leaving room for what students are going to come at you with because you want to be responsive to them and their interests and their needs. So you can't plan it to the nth degree. Don't even try because you're going to just change it anyways. Mm -hmm. And really just, I guess I can't say it enough, but just get to the the essence of it. What is, what is it exactly that you're teaching and let the other stuff go. Yeah. Let all the peripheral, let all the supplemental stuff just kind of go. And you're, you'll find that I think you get uh, a depth of content and you get a depth of understanding that you might be surprised at. Yeah. It, I think with all of the different, you know, piece of advice that, that are out there, the one universal piece of advice that I think everyone is, is saying is prioritize you know, mm-hmm. prioritize, prioritize, look at what's most essential and, and, uh, and you can still provide a rich learning experience for students, even if they're not, it's interesting, that whole idea of, of falling behind simply because yeah. they haven't done certain content from the past. And that doesn't really mean they're falling behind. It, it means mm-hmm. that they're not doing what other students might've done in the past, but that doesn't mean that you can't still provide a rich learning experience for students. And I think it's clear that you right. can yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, there are just, there are so many standards, some content areas just have it's unrealistic ridiculous. numbers of standards. <laughs> yeah. So we know we're not mastering a hundred standards, Yeah, like just leave it. It's okay. Let it go. Right. Just, yeah. It's okay. <laughs> That's right. Do you, do you have a, a process that you use? Like when you, when you approach online learning, do you approach mm-hmm. it that way? Uh, if, if from the start, the, 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 the whole context is an online learning environment. Do you start mm-hmm. by prioritizing learning that way? Is that something you do with your absolutely. students? Yeah, 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 absolutely. I right. take a look at the standards and then I talk with the teacher who's teaching below me and above me, and we mm-hmm. make sure that we've made it so that it's a nice linear progression and that right. we're not, you know, leaving any gaps there. But absolutely, you just you have to prioritize it and yeah, and do what is reasonable and do what is what right. is what you can in a year. Right. Isn't that, you know, I've I've said for years, you know, one of the, one of the policies that should override all of our policies is the policy of reasonableness. Are you being reasonable with students? Are, is your, is your ask of them reasonable, you know, and that, that, that whole notion of reasonableness can be, you know, placed upon almost any circumstance and just say, is that a reasonable number of standards that you think you can move your, you know, address? Is there a, is there an ideal online model? So how, how do schools decide, um, you know, if a district wanted to add an online component and, or, or at least, and most districts have that. So a district wants to enhance their model. Um, what, what's, what's the best way to go about that? What's, is there an ideal model? And, and if so, what is it? Mm. And if not, then how would a district go about deciding what their model should look like? Yeah. I wish I could tell you there's an ideal model. Yeah, sure. Here it is. And I can just follow this and everything will be fine. Right. No, there is no ideal model because you're working with people. And mm-hmm. so there's always going to be a diversity of people, a diversity of needs, and you just have to be responsive to that. So uh, one of the things we do at SYS is figure out what your assets are and figure out what your needs are, mm-hmm. and then go from there to build in. I think the biggest piece of advice I can give to school districts or schools considering an online option is to just know your vision and know your mission. What is it you want to provide? What, why are you providing that? And, and go from there. So some schools maybe just want to do a, a K-5 model. And they, you know, we just want to have K-5 online and, and this is what we're going to do. Other schools want to, you know, have a robust high school with a, a bajillion options. And that's two different missions, two different visions of what the school is and why it's, why it's there. So I think you really have to start with that. What, what is your mission and vision? Why are you doing this? Why are you building this? What do you hope to serve? How do you hope to serve students in this way? And who, and who is it for? Mm-hmm. Start there and, and that will help determine what you're going to do next. I think there are definitely technology tools that are great and that work really well. And I'm like I said, I'm a big fan of Zoom and Canvas. I think they're really adaptable and, and easy to use and they work well. Um, 
but there is no, there is no one right way to go about it. You have to take Mm -hmm. into consideration the tools you have, the assets you have in terms of personnel and technology already, and then what your opportunity for growth is realistically, what can we do and, and what are we going to going to do but just starting with the mission and vision i think so often we just we forget about that or it's just a thing that's kind of written on a piece of paper and doesn't mean anything (laughs) to us but like if you really hone in on that if you have a really well written mission if you have a really well written vision that's going to drive what you what you do and how you do it yeah that that's a whole different problem if your mission and vision is just on a placard or a piece of paper and you've completely forgotten about it it's interesting because um And I'd be interested in your take on this because that's the kind of advice I've given to teachers when they've talked about what technology should I use? Like what, what, what new technology should I use? And my advice to them is always, what do you want to do? Mm -hmm. And then find the technology that'll help you do that. Don't just say, I want to try this platform or that platform. It may not be suitable. Is that, is that the right advice that I'm giving them? Natalie, is that, am I on point with that? (laughs) In my my expert opinion. Yes. Perfect. I just (laughs) need your approval. (laughs) Yeah. Stamped. Um, Yeah. You it's, what are you doing and why are you doing it? I mean, why is like the question of my life. I think it's something I ask as a special ed teacher, as someone mm-hmm. who's trying to get to the root of behaviors with kids or adults right. and why, why are we doing this? So look at your beliefs. What do you, what do you need? What is, what is it that you're prioritizing? Okay. Let's find the right tool for that. So, you know, it's sort of like, we yeah. wouldn't just say, I want to wake up today and I'm going to use a ruler. I'm going to figure out a way to use this ruler. It's like, well, no, right. you're going to say, I need to measure something today. All right. What right. am I going to use to measure? Right. So yeah. it's that kind of thing. Do you have any favorite, um, you know, now to contradict myself, <laughs> do you, do you have any favorite, um, programs that you're really drawn to for certain activities or, you know, for example, if you're doing yeah. online group work or if you were doing, uh, for sure. you know, whatever. So what are some of your favorites? Maybe that listeners can just sort of tap into to explore and say, yeah. Yeah, these are really helpful. Absolutely. The thing of the thing of the moment a little bit. Yeah. Right, Cause the technology right. is constantly changing and getting constantly. better, which is pretty fun and maybe a little frustrating. So I always say like, just pick something and stick with it at Mm -hmm. least for some amount of time, because it's going to be okay and use it to its full degree. But I really like Pear Deck right now. Mm -hmm. I've been using Pear Deck even with kindergartners. So it makes your slides interactive. Kids can move a little dot or star around and show you what they're pointing at. They can draw on the slide Mm -hmm. or type. Mm -hmm. That's been really fun for them and allows for just increased interaction online. And that's been, that's been awesome. Sketch Toy is another one that I've used a ton. It's a great way for kids to show their math thinking. Pair sketch toy with something like Screencastify, which is going to record their screen and possibly even their face if they want it to. And you can see them doing their own Khan Academy type video for you, which is, which is awesome. Yeah. And Google, Google for apps for education are just, they're fantastic Fantastic, docs and slides. Yeah. Those are, you can use them for anything. I mean, group work, differentiating assignments. I love using slides to differentiate, you know, you've got a group of 30 kids and you need to provide them with, you know, a lesson on X, but at three different levels, well, then you Mm. can just link three different slides within that slide deck. And here you go, guys, you know, pick the one that seems to suit you best and let them self-select even it's, it's so powerful and so easy. You make it sound easy. And I'm picturing myself <laughs> trying to, Nat, Natalie just said, I just have to move three slides and here you go guys. And two and a half hours later, <laughs> that's true. That's true. I'm emailing Natalie again, going, you said this was easy. Um, you can it, do it, that. You're right. it is, that. uh, it is interesting because I had, uh, Bill Ferreter on in the fall and he talked about Pear Deck as well being oh, a yeah. platform that he really thought was favorable. So it's interesting that you mentioned that as well. So Clearly, listeners, that is something. Uh, if you haven't checked it out yet, you probably should because a couple of endorsements from from those who are doing the work for sure. Okay, let's um, let's finish up. I want to give you the opportunity to talk a little bit about SYS and um, you know sure. what is SYS? What's what's the mission? Uh, what are some of the services you offer so that if schools are looking to enhance their online experience for students long term? Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, the acute pivots to remote learning are one thing, but the idea of saying, hey, this has really showed us that we need to think about this online environment long term. How does SYS contribute to that? Uh, What's the mission? What's the goal? Uh, What's the work that you do? Yeah, SYS is 
Awesome. It's probably the <laughs> favorite job I've had in my career thus far. I really enjoy working with SYS. It's an educational service provider is really what we are. Um, and we start with our beliefs and our mission and vision, and that's how we work with districts. So we take what we believe about education, that all students can learn, that all students can learn in an inclusive setting, and that technology is is a vehicle that will get them there. And then we work to, to help districts realize that for, for their own students. And so we do a lot of things around universal design for learning and flipped class model and supporting teachers with instructional coaching, all of that. And our mission really is to educate students. And so even though through SYS, my role isn't a teacher, we're sort of adjacent to that, where the support underneath holding, holding you up as, as you need and guiding you. So it's a different role within education, but it's still that same mission of, of educating kids. Um, the really neat thing about SYS that I've experienced as a, an employee there is that our tech team is also like just knee deep in education. So they understand exactly what teachers are doing and what they're trying to accomplish. And then they're the tech expert to figure out, okay, this is the tool. This is the right tool. That's going to help you do that. Stop using this tool. Try using this one instead, that kind of thing. They're very, very understanding of what educators are really trying to accomplish and, and making sure that they have the tools to do that. So SOS does a ton. We do device management, we do marketing, enrollment, um, we develop our own software. And so we're kind of a, a little bit of everything that you, you might yeah, need to kickstart yeah. your program. Um, you know, like if, if a school were interested in hiring us to help manage, it's not like we're going to rope you into a curriculum or a product or anything like that. We really look at your, like I said before, your assets and your needs, and then we want to engage with you and be collaborative and figure out how to, how to make it work for your situation. Cause every place is so unique. Right. Right. So yeah, no, yeah. It, it must make such a difference to have a tech department that, that understands education. I think so often in school districts, even within the school district, you have tech departments that, that work more from the tech side, but don't really understand learning at that kind of intimate level that is so right. necessary to help give advice and coach people on what platform or what technology or, or, or how to go about the work that must make such a difference exactly. uh, for your work, but also for yeah. the school districts that are, that are looking to you to say, you know, what should we do and looking for advice that is sound. So that must make a, a huge difference for them. It's really awesome. Yeah. We have mm -hmm. a series of instructional coaches and then tech mm -hmm. agents. And so I'm one of the instructional coaches and we just work hand in hand with them all mm -hmm. the time. And it's, it's fantastic because we learn from one another too. So they're right. making us stronger with our technology as well, which, you know, asked me 10 years ago, I would have been like, no, not, right. not strong right. there. And now I feel really good. So yeah. Yeah. You, well, you made it sound so easy, right? No, you just move slides around. No problem. You just move uh, a few slides around, link a couple no things. And no, you're big good. Deal. No. no big deal. No big deal. Have your you practice and you messed it up a couple of times. Then it's For no sure. big deal. Uh, Natalie, this has been fascinating. I, I really am. Uh, this is for me, obviously, a, a a foreign world, the online world uh, is not something I've ever worked in or been directly responsible for facilitating facilitating at a school district level. So I've been just really interested and I'm so glad we had a chance to, uh, to connect today. Uh, we're gonna finish uh, the interview with a segment I call three questions. We're gonna have a little fun here mm -hmm. toward the end of the interview and I'm gonna ask you three lighthearted questions so listeners can get to know Natalie a little bit. Uh, nothing too intrusive, but to get to know you a little bit on a personal level. And then we've got one final question as well. And the quite yeah, the questions are a little silly. They're a little fun, uh, and you can I'm take them. It. You can take them wherever you want to. All right. So here, <laughs> here's the here's the uh, the first question, Natalie. What is your favorite smell? Oh, hmm, that's a good one. I could, I could wax really corny and sweet and say the top of my daughter's head. That's probably one of my favorite smells. <laughs> that can be one of your favorite smells. Absolutely. It I know is. exactly it what you're totally talking is. about. Yeah. There's, there's <laughs> nothing like that for sure. Um, okay. Number two, what is the one thing that you have absolutely no patience for? Oh, oh. That's hard. <laughs> Take your time. I am a, I am a selectively really patient person. And then 
selectively not at all patient. Like yesterday <laughs> we were, <laughs> we were walking to the park. My husband and I are walking to the park. My daughter's riding her bike and there's this teenager who zoomed up and I'm being such like an old lady, even as I say this, I know, but you know, there's a younger person driving a car, talking on a cell phone. And I just, I had no inhibition. I said, get off your phone. <laughs> I just yelled. So I think sometimes I have no, no patience for distracted driving. That's the thing that I, yeah. I don't know why I, I have no personal experience to, yeah. to pull from, but I just, ah, oh, I don't know. That rubs me the wrong way. Well, it's probably a good thing to have no patience for that's for sure. Okay. Uh, especially, <laughs> especially with your daughter in the vicinity. I think we all get a Mama little bear. Yeah, Mama Bear, exactly. <laughs> All right. Third question. Um, the third question is, uh, what song, regardless of what's happening in your life, immediately puts you in a good mood? <laughs> oh, that's good. You know, probably Vanilla Ice. <laughs> okay. I wasn't expecting when. that. Yeah, yeah I, right? No, yeah. That's, a, that's a good one. That'll do it. Okay. And we're talking know, Ice more, Ice Baby, right? We're not, we're yeah, not going deep course. tracks. Yeah, of course. I don't know. Yeah. I'm like, are there any others? I exactly. think that's it. Yeah. That's the one. <laughs> yeah. I, was, how do you, I don't know. That one's just okay. silly. Right. And... Yeah. It's all in good fun. And it's so retro now that it's almost, you know, there's a kind of uh, enjoyment right? to it. I, I was, I was, I was wondering because I thought if you can name a second Vanilla Ice song, then you're a fan because uh, yeah, I don't think no, I could. it doesn't go that deep. No, it doesn't go that deep. <laughs> no, no deep cuts <laughs> from the archives, Vanilla Ice, mm, you know, unfortunately B, not. B-sides, no. So, oh, that's good. <laughs> I, you know what? I'm going to have to play that song tonight and just, uh, right? and just see if that's a, a, a mood it's just changer. It's going to make you move. Move a little. Make you move yep. a little for sure. Okay. So one final question for you, Natalie. Um, as this is a question I've asked everyone who's come on the podcast. One of the themes I'm trying to run through the podcast is the theme of success and happiness and, and just thinking about different people's perspectives on what it means yeah. to be successful. So the question um, I want to finish with is this question. If a random person uh, stopped you on the street and asked you, uh, what is your definition of success? How would you answer them? My definition of success for me is my legacy. I think if I can say at the end of my day that I've put more good out there than bad, mm. then I've been successful. I think of the teachers who I think about now and who I remember fondly. I'm 37 mm. and the teachers who stuck with me, who are still in my head and make me smile. Like I want to be that teacher to a kid. Mm -hmm. I want to be that person at school who they think back on 25 years later and yeah. say, you know what? Yeah, Mrs. Conway, smile. You know, that's it. That's, that's all I need for success is to know that I've had an impact on kids, that I've had an impact on education, and that, that more of that impact has been positive than negative. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think that that would be, uh, you know, if we all left a positive legacy on our students and, and in the world, I think we would all be successful. That's for sure. Yeah, uh, I Natalie, so. I, um, I really appreciate you taking the time uh, to be here today. Listeners would really encourage you to follow Natalie on Twitter. Her Twitter handle is at AOE Natalie. That's capital AOE Natalie. Uh, the Adventures in Online Education podcast that also has a, a uh, separate Twitter handle. I'd also encourage you to follow yeah. that so you can get updated on, on different episodes. That's at SYS Presents. That's the Twitter handle for the podcast. And you can subscribe and listen to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher. I uh, would also encourage you to check out the SYS uh, website. I was on there uh, prior to the interview, of course, and checking out some of this and some of the information and, and services available and really, really good awesome. information on there. So uh, that's Thank at www.systeducation.com. Dot org. So uh, check check out Natalie on Twitter, check out the podcast on Twitter, as well as on those different podcast platforms and the SYS website. Natalie, thanks so much for joining me today. Absolutely. Thank you for having me, Tom. It's been fun. In Assessment Corner this week, I'm going to focus on one specific aspect of report card reform. I've had a couple of questions this week about it in a couple of the trainings I was doing, and actually had a chance to review one school's draft of their revised report card, so the topic has been on my mind. 
Now, I realize that for many listeners, the report card is not within your sphere of influence. It may be predetermined by the state or the province, or you may be part of a large district and that's determined at the district level and you just have little to no control over that. This is probably a good time to remind you that the prescribed report card is not the only way or only time that you can report to parents, right, and to families. And don't forget that part of the equation. Don't lose sight that the report card or the reporting system is actually one of the most important aspects of our job. Instead of thinking, oh boy, I have to do report cards this weekend or something like that, think about it's time to communicate with parents and others about how well their children or how well the students are learning, depending on who the audience is. We don't do report cards because evil administrators just want to give you one more task to complete. We do report cards because communicating with parents about achievement, about the growth, and the attributes their children have developed is an essential part of our core responsibilities. Now, I'm all over the conversation about how we could make report cards or reporting systems more effective and efficient and more meaningful. Absolutely. But this fantastical desire to get rid of report cards altogether is a pipe dream. Our students are minors. End of story. And like I said, I'm certain we can come up with more effective ways to communicate, but communicate we must. And that's just not going away. Now, there are obviously many aspects of a report card that needs to be considered um, in terms of, you know, purpose of the report card, the formatting, the structure, all of that. The one aspect that seems to be overlooked more than most is the question of consumability. In other words, once we're done with our revisions, will the parents actually understand what we're telling them? Like, will families be able to consume what it is we're telling them? Because I know this much, if what you send or make available is not consumable, they're going to email you or call you and ask, tell me how she's really doing. There is a threshold where you're providing way too much information. And I sort of liken it to when you pick up your car from the mechanic. Now, I would consider myself somewhere in the middle when it comes to being handy. There are things I can do and many more that I can't. But when it comes to cars, I am definitely on the lower end of that continuum. So imagine you go to your mechanic. Let's say you had to have your transmission replaced and uh, it was repaired or replaced. And the mechanic uh, comes out from the, from the garage and comes into the front part of the, the shop. And before you get your keys, starts launching into this detailed explanation about what had to be done in order to repair your car. So imagine the mechanic saying something like this. Okay, so... To gain access to the torque converter bolts, I had to remove the inspection plate and cover, which is located at the bottom front of the bell housing. So the cover is normally made of this thin metal or aluminum, and it's held in place by several 10 millimeter or even 12 millimeter bolts. So once I removed the cover, I had to use a flashlight to look inside the bell housing to locate the bolts and nuts, holding the torque converter to the flywheel or the flex plate. Now here's the deal. You can only remove one bolt or nut at a time before having to rotate the engine to gain access to the next bolt or nut, right? You would be standing there looking at your mechanic, thinking to yourself, okay, yeah, good. Does my car work? Like, can I pay? And is, is my transmission fixed? Can I, can I go home now? I mean, sure, there are some people who might be interested in that level of detail, but most are going to stand there with just looking at the mechanics saying like, okay, enough already. I, I get it. Now, just for the record, um, I had to Google that description uh, of how to repair a transmission. <laughs> so the question when you're revising your report card is not just how much detail can we squeeze in here? The question is how much detail can we provide families without overwhelming them? Because here's what I know. For the past five or six years or so, maybe even longer, but you know, I'm not formally tracking this, but for the past five or six years at least, when conducting workshops on assessment and grading, I often ask participants, and obviously the vast majority of the audience are teachers and principals, I ask the audience, for those who are parents who have children in the school system, how much time do you spend on your child's report card? Okay, remember, these are educators. So the idea that, you know, from the time it, I know this is not the only time you talk about education, but, but from the time it comes home or is made available, right? It comes home, you have access to it, you consume it, you talk to your child, you apply the grounding, you get back to your real life. Okay. What, how long do you spend on that? 
the unofficial average of all the participants I've asked that question of, and it is literally hundreds, is about 10 minutes. And again, these are educators. Now imagine non-educators. We go from a report card that took them 10 minutes to consume, maybe 15, to one that takes them 45 minutes to consume, to try to make sense of. I'm sorry, that's not going to happen. And let's not pretend that the unwillingness to spend 45 minutes on a report card is reflective of their indifference toward their child's education. It's not. Okay, families are busy. Life is stressful. They send their children to us because we're the ones who are supposed to educate them, and then we find efficient and effective ways to communicate with families. Okay? You add in COVID, and that stress and busyness is multiplied exponentially. So we have to remember that families, parents, are the end users of the report card. They are the primary end users of this report card. You already know this information, and hopefully your students do too. It shouldn't take the report card for students to find out how they're doing. So while more detail is always possible, we can't end up with a report card that's spiral bound or a 20 page PDF document. One of the recommendations I often make to schools is to put together a focus group. So if you have the opportunity to revise your report card and you've got a couple of, you've narrowed it down to a few options, put together a focus group that is kind of a microcosm of your school's you know, family population, just a cross-section, race, gender, working class, etc., just all different demographics, just so you can get a sense of, of where parents are with this process. Then create a few mock-ups and ask them for their input and ask them a few questions. Ask them something like, you know, if we sent this home to you, is it clear what we're communicating? Uh, what questions come to mind as you read through it? Do you find anything about this new reporting system or new report card, anything about it confusing? And maybe, you know, what suggestions do you have for us? How can we clean this up for you? How can we make it easier for you to understand? The whole point of revising your reporting system is to increase the clarity, the accuracy, and the transparency of what's being reported. So the question is, does the revised report card or revised reporting system actually do that? So we might think an exhaustive list of the standards we covered on the report card might be the most desirable, and yet for families, it's just this blur of size 8 font statements. At some point, as well, the standards themselves are going to be out of reach for some parents. Okay, Families may not be able to, at some point, be able to understand what it is we put on the report card. Not because they're not intelligent, but because they're not teachers. Okay, The standards are written for us. They're written for educators. And it's our job to make sense of them and to make sure that we are being professionally responsible to them. Of course, they're available online and parents can consume them and they can ask questions about what they mean. But again, there does come a point where we cross that line. I remember my son when he was in the last year of high school, he was in his, his uh, grade 12 year, and he would come home and say, hey, dad, can you, can you help me with my physics homework? And the answer was no, absolutely not. I can't. I don't even know what that is. Right. And I'm educated. So we have to understand there does come a point where the standards aren't consumable to the parents. Again, not because they're not intelligent. It's just because it's not written really for them. We have to find the balance between increasing the detail and specificity with which we report without crossing the line and you know, getting to a place where this new revised report card becomes less helpful and less clear. Now, as I said, there are many aspects of a revised report card that need to be considered. But the ability for parents and families to consume the report card or to consume what's made available to them needs to be prioritized. A few announcements as we close out today. First, the two-day Grading from the Inside Out virtual training is happening this month. So day one will be March 16th. Day two will be March 23rd. So still time to sign up and register for that. Also this summer, uh, as I mentioned last week, the Achieve Institute, which is the Institute about promising practices in instruction, assessment, and grading, will be going virtual this August, August 16th through 18th. And the nice part about virtual events, of course, is that you can participate in the event literally from anywhere in the world. So if you are interested in either of those events, head over to the solutiontree.com website for details about registration. And I've also 
added links uh, to both of those events in the show notes. Uh, remember to follow the podcast Twitter account for updates. That's at Tom Shimmer Pod. My personal Twitter handle is at Tom Shimmer, where you'll get lots of updates on what's happening with the show. Shimmer Education on Facebook, Tom Shimmer Podcast on Instagram. Uh, that's all the social media platforms. Uh, it's probably enough. <laughs> and uh, please email your questions uh, for Assessment Corner or suggestions you have uh, for the podcast to tomshimmerpod at gmail.com. And don't forget to check out the YouTube channel as well, um, Tom Shimmer Podcast on YouTube. I just recently posted the video version of the bonus episode I did with Tom Gusky about standardized testing, so you can check that out. Might be good. Uh, it's about a 30 minute conversation, as many of you have heard, and might be good to um, maybe spark some conversation uh, with your staff and, and colleagues, et cetera. Next week, my guest will be Alexa Schmidt. Alexa is the middle school principal at the International School of Kenya in Nairobi. Alexa recently completed her doctoral studies in justice, equity, and cultural competence in international education. So we're going to dive into her findings in her research, and her thoughts about promising practices and permanent changes necessary going forward. Please subscribe, rate, and review the podcast, especially on Apple Podcasts, as I always say. And of course, if you like what you're hearing and you think others would benefit, please feel free to spread the word about the podcast to some of your colleagues or maybe through social media. I would, as I always say, greatly appreciate that. Have a great week, everyone. 